This is the Lessons of the 60s, a project of the Institute for Policy Studies. Today we are interviewing Julie Huff. My name is Anka Decker. Our videographer is Peter Roof. Today is August 11, 2016. Julie Huff is a, is a public health nurse and an adjunct professor at Georgetown University. Julie is a poet and a playwright and a relentless advocate for stronger, safer gun laws. Julie is the mother of two sons. She is a committed activist for gay rights in support of her oldest son, Joe. She is also recently a grandmother of twin boys, a gift from her youngest son, Dan. She has been married to John Hannon for 37 years. Hi, Julie. Hi. Tell us about your early life and what brought you to Washington, D.C. Well, I grew up in the Deep South. I was in my, when I was a kid, I grew up in, uh, I was in Birmingham, Alabama until I was about 13 and then moved to Atlanta, Georgia until I left for college. And um, my, you know, had a, lived in Birmingham, you know, I had a great kind of suburban life. Uh, and it was actually in the city and I lived on a street called Diaper Row and a house that my father built. He was an architect and he designed and built um, our first house and had a kind of really one of those, you know, kind of a 50s childhood of just of being free after school and wandering around in the woods and having fantasy play and doing what I wanted to do and being, you know, kind of very free and, um, and fun and riding bikes and getting lost in the woods and going through old mining tunnels in Birmingham. Um, and you know, you know, when I think of it now, it's really an idyllic childhood in that way. Um, went to a public elementary school that was, of course, segregated because this was Birmingham, Alabama, in the fifties. Um, but except, but other than race, a very uh, ethnically and uh, socioeconomically diverse. So that we had um, very, you know, poor kids, middle class kids, and upper middle, upper class kids all in the same grades and schools and so it was a great you know that way in that way it was a real melting pot um, and very different from what I think of in schools today elementary and high schools today public schools anyway um, and um, I uh, then moved when I was a teenager young teenager to uh, my father was transferred and moved to Atlanta Georgia um, and was pretty miserable for most of high school. Um, I think being a very bookish, intellectual um, child uh, and girl, uh, you know, once reaching adolescence made it much harder to uh, go to a public school where um, cheerleaders were the big, you know, where, where there was a, you know, where the whole social class came, thing was about cheerleading and football and where I was bored out of my mind. Um, so for a couple of years, and also the, just the transition from going from one uh, a fairly stable, um, interest, more interesting neighborhood to a, kind of an outer suburb of Atlanta, um, you know, was a shock. And um, the civil rights movement was just beginning, um, and I, you know, felt very drawn to it. Uh, you know, I think mostly from um, having read a lot, having a sense of the unfairness of uh, race relations in the Deep South and how awful it was and uh, seeing my grandparents do things like, you know, use the N-word and um, say things that were just horrifying to me. Um, and, you know, thinking, well, if these sweet little people could do this, what, you know, what else is going on? Um, but I do think that things like watching on television while Bull Connor turned the hoses and the dogs on civil rights demonstrations was just really, you know, a big turning point. Um, or a bit, you know, having, see that, seeing that on television and thinking, how could that happen? How could that happen in the town I lived in? How could this be? Um, you were was, in Atlanta um, by Yeah, then? I was in Atlanta. It was so just it was shocking. Year? Yeah, yeah, it was 1963. And it was just shocking, you know, I couldn't believe it was happening. And so, um, you know, so that was kind of, so then I, you know, and of course lots was happening in both Birmingham and Atlanta. And, you know, I 
would sneak out of the house as I got a little bit older and could drive or you know and had more freedom I would sneak out of the house to go to um, you know a couple of rallies civil rights rallies and um, go to uh, Hootenannies which is kind of a was a big hippie music festival of folk music that was kind of associated with the uh, civil rights movements at that point and um, then I in my junior year was it junior year I uh, campaigned for Johnson um, with the uh, express purpose because I wanted to meet Peter Paul and Mary who were coming to a concert but that, uh, who were coming to do a concert but um, that was kind of an eye-opening experience of being you know part of the political process um, and certainly were your parents Johnson supporters? No, no, not at all, not at all. I would say my mother was kind of eh, but my father was definitely you know a, a strict Republican and no. The Goldwater supporter? I, I think he probably would have. You know, I mean, he wasn't you know a uh, die-hard die Goldwater is the man for us, but he would have probably voted. I'm sure he voted for Goldwater, um, and uh, so uh, you know, which made it difficult sometimes. But they you know they were fairly you know they kind of let me do what I did and, you know, wander the neighborhood giving out, um, giving out flyers and um, going to rallies and, you know, things like that. So it was not, you know, a huge thing. Um, and, I, you know, I just got, I think in Atlanta, is, I, things got more, um, I think Atlanta was considered, at that point, um, they had a very progressive governor, and I can't remember his name. Um, and so things were very different than in Birmingham. Um, when I, one of the first things, first experience of integration for me in the civil rights movement was being in a, a, summer's, a summer program called the Governor's Honors Program uh, between my um, sophomore and junior year. And it was the first integrated program in Georgia as far as I know. And so it was a, you know, it was a big deal. It was in Macon, Georgia at a college and basically we were housed together, everybody was housed together, um, and uh, we had, a, you know, it was about 500 kids, uh, you know, who I guess now it would be called gifted and talented kids, and um, when we would walk down the streets of Macon, Georgia, in groups, uh, you know, in integrated groups, people would line both sides of the streets and stare um, and spit, and I don't remember ever having rocks thrown, but there was certainly a sense of menace and a sense of, you know, you know, you people don't have no right to be here. You people don't have no right to do it, you know. And so it was scary. It was scary, you know. And um, and some of us, I think, really were into that. I mean, we're into proving that we could do that. We could walk down the street or the sidewalk in an integrated group. And this was our right, and this was to protect the African, you know, the African Americans, the black people with us. And so, um, you know, so it was, it was really a wonderful experience in that way, um, you know. And it was also wonderful because it was a lot of people who were more like me, who were, you know, serious, who were intellectual, who studied, who cared about something other than the local, the uh, next score, football score, or the next cheerleader score, or who was going out with who, et cetera. Um, so, so, it was a radicalizing um, experience. so it was a very radicalizing experience, and just a feeling of I'm with my people. You know, I am with my people. I'm here, and uh, this is great. Um, and when you got back so, to high school, um, I was very depressed. You know, I was very depressed. It was really hard to be back and be back in a normal environment. The only good thing is that I had moved um, the year before to a new school. It was a very small. It's a public school, but it was very small because we were the first graduating class. And I think because it was the tail end of the 60s, the principal was into trying to be a little more liberal, quote liberal, and kind of let kids do a little more what they wanted to do. And I had, some, had a fair amount of classes with just eight or nine people in it the, who, you know, were serious students. Um, you know, so we had a Russian class where I studied Russian for four years. And a physics class and things that weren't, you know, kind of, and there was a, a group of, again, eight or nine of us who, um, you know, were probably more similar, more, you know, in the more intellectual group. And so that helped, that helped, in, you know, in that. And then, you know, when I did, you know, produced plays and did a lot of things, you know, some the got into theater, doing theater. Um, 
and so that that helped in my junior and senior year. Um, Do I remember so, a story about so. an act of rebellion that got a teacher fired? Well, there was it wasn't wasn't with there were two things. One um, in the at the governor's honors program, we put together a that was the week that was a skit series of skits, and it was pretty over the top, and that got a teacher from that program fired. That our, our advisor fired. Um, and then we did it again, I did it again in my high school, in senior year high school, and we were censored. Um, and then in our, in our um, graduation, for graduation, one of the, we, had, we had one Jewish kid in the class. That was a very small graduating class, I think 125 people. And one of the things that we wanted was that the principal not say Jesus Christ in the baccalaureate prayer. So we went to the principal, you know, a group of us went to the principal and said, you know, we respectfully ask that you not put Jesus Christ in this prayer because that's offensive to some people. And he's, he agreed. Um, and so we were at the baccalaureate and he said, in the name of Jesus Christ, so a group of about five or six of us got up and walked out and left the baccalaureate. Um, and what did your so, parents say about that? Um, I don't think they were happy about it. Um, you know, they not, not really happy about it. I think they, they're probably embarrassed. You know, I don't remember very much. You know, it wasn't graduation. It wasn't. You know, so I guess that was le less important. If it had been graduation, I'm sure they'd been very upset. But. Um, you know, but we'd said that was what we were going to do, so You went we did to it. Uh, New mm -hmm. College in right. Sarasota, Florida? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How did you come to choose that school? Uh, I applied for you know, several schools and really wanted to go to Antioch College because it was, again, you know, more progressive and interesting and I wanted to work and my father said, no way am I ever going to pay for that commie school <laughs> and I'll never let you go near that school. And New College, I think, was similar. It was a new col. It was again a product of the '60s. It was based on New College in Oxford, um, so that all the classes were seminar. Were going to be seminars. Arnold Toynbee was there for a couple of years when it first started, and other you know kind of stars. Um, it was all an integrated curriculum and very different from you know typical colleges. Um, and I kind of got recruited because I was a National Merit semifinalist, and they sent out a letter to all the National Merit finalists and semifinalists saying, you know, you are the cream of your crop, blah, 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 come to our college that's brand new. And so we went to see it, and, you know, my parents actually liked it because they were architects, and it, the dorms were designed by I.M. Pei, and it was in Florida. So Florida was, uh, uh, you know, they, we had spent a lot of our summers in Florida because that's where my grandparents had a house and they, they were comfortable with me still being in the South, I think, and Florida seemed a lot safer than Ohio. And so, you know, and they, I got a decent scholarship. Um, so that seemed okay. So I arrived on campus wearing villager clothes, five or six pairs of white gloves, pearls, and arrived on campus and nobody was wearing underwear. <laughs> so it was a total shock to me, you know, kind of being on a campus. A very small school, very, at that point a very tiny school. I think uh, my class was not more than 100 and probably a lot of dropouts. And I was the third class, I was in the third class. Um, it was a class, it was a school that uh, you graduated in three years. So we were the third class um, to start there. Uh, so very small, very informal, very intense relationships with professors and other students, and um, you know, lots of uh, lots of intense discussions, uh, some activism. I think there was. An, I don't know if it was because we were in the South, in in a in Florida, in kind of a bubble in Sarasota, or. Um, why in particular, or, or so it was a sort of small campus, but there was not the kind of student activism going on, in, at, even though it was the time of a lot of student activism going on in larger campuses and, and bigger places. Um, so there was you know, activism, but it was not anything There was, I don't think, you know, there was not a lot going on. I mean, there was some, we had did some um, work in the community, uh, 
you know, in Sarasota um, and some anti-war, uh, you know, protests. But it was, uh, you know, it was certainly less than many pl people experienced during that same time period. Um, so. Um, what brought you to Washington, D.C.? Um, my last semester, uh, I was, well, I was in my third year in the fall semester, and I came up here in the fall to a housing co-op conference that was held at the Washington Hilton. And I had worked uh, with students to form the first uh, new college uh, housing co-op. And so we thought it would be interesting to come and see what it was like, um, you know, to what the conference was like and what ideas they brought forth and what, you know, how, you know, around co-housing and intentional community, because we were very serious about intentional community. And I had been in Washington the prior spring break with a friend and stayed at the Cairo with um, somebody's sister. And to me, Washington just seemed like the city on the hill. This, the sister was um, the mistress of a diplomat and um, worked on the hill and seemed to have this glamorous, wonderful life, you know, living in the Cairo and DuPont Circle and everything. It just seemed like really this was the place, you know, after little, you know, Sarasota, Florida that was, um, you know, kind of a bubble of either people over 80 and us. Um, so, so, you know, it seemed like a, that seemed really appealing. Um, and then I had a couple of experiences. I had broken up with my boyfriend over the summer. Um, uh, basically, um, because I wasn't ready for a full-time commitment and um, wanted, you know, kind of to have more freedom and that just seemed too young to be, you know, kind of um, committed to one per a person uh, at my age, and so in the so he ended up having, you know, starting another relationship, and then, you know, so that, you know, I was pretty freaked out over that. It was hard, even though I'd, you know, broken up with him. It was there was a lot of pain, and then I had a couple of incidences of sexual um, harassment, and two friends, two actually guy friends who um, basically attacked me and felt me up and grabbed my boobs and, you know, my vagina and, you know, did other unpleasant things when they were drunk. And, um, you know, and I, you know, it was so, so I, you know, kind of, and, and I never connected that until a few years ago, actually, until, uh, you know, I started reading all this stuff about campus rape and campus sexual abuse. So it just seemed that, you know, Connected so that, that with, with what happened. Ha yeah, right, yeah. exactly. And so I, um, you know, I was pretty clinically depressed for a few weeks, which I, you know, to the point of not being able to get out of bed and having, just having it be very difficult. And um, then at some point, it just seemed a good idea to do something else and leave. And, you know, I'd met some people in, at the, uh, in, from D.C. at the housing conference, including a boy, of course. It's always a boy in there. And um, so he said, come to Washington. Come to Washington and your life will be wonderful. <laughs> and, you know, several other people, uh, other boys too. So I thought, well, hey, it couldn't be much worse than this at this point. And I took a leave of absence, which distressed my parents no end. And um, Packed up and uh, came to Washington. I had a basically all I had I had to finish. I had to finish a senior thesis, and then I would have graduated. I had one semester left, and you know, writing a senior thesis, and that was my goal: is to come to Washington and um, you know, be an activist and write my senior thesis. So, so that's how I got to Washington, um, and I ended up in a kind of a part of a group of houses that were kind of around intentional community on, as a house on S Street, um, huge house that had once been, as I remember, a brothel and um, had been, you know, it was a, you know, that uh, two guys from this group bought for $25,000. Uh, I think there were about eight of us, eight or nine of us in the community and um, we, uh, you know, we kind of worked out how we were going to live. Um, we shared everything, you know, shared rent, shared food, uh, shared clothes. I mean, it was kind of the extreme of intentional community. Um, I think at that point, everything, our living expenses were $25 a month. Um, 
and um, you know, so I kind of started getting involved in uh, working around the anti-war stuff. The MOB was coming up. Things were, you know, the counter inaugural was coming up, and there was a lot happening. And I, you know, got involved in, you know, in that and being an activist, an anti-war activist, um, and then. Uh, you know, then over the, and then into the women's movement, um, what over were the your next, early women's liberation. Oh, um, um, I think a lot of consciousness raising groups. Everybody went to consciousness raising groups, and we were doing a lot of activism around um, uh, imperialism. Uh, we, I, we, there was a group called Women's International Terrorist Conspiracy from Hell, which. And we dressed up in witch costumes and went around and um, chanted and, and uh, you know chanted uh, things around at, around the United Fruit Company and around um, uh, international birth control issues and. So this is a street theater group. Pardon. A street theater. Yes. Group, yes. Gorilla exactly. Theater. Gorilla theater. Really, it was all yeah. street and guerrilla theater. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sounds like and fun. It was great. It was really fun. Um, and then I was involved in, um, uh, you know, anti-war work with women and peace, and um, uh, you know, through the kind of through the women's liberation movement. Um, I worked around women's health issues, some around birth control pill and um, uh, and abortion counseling in D.C. Um, and uh, did some, you know, and then worked with Off Our Backs, a newspaper, which is a feminist newspaper that was uh, started in the 60s. Um, I wrote a column um, called The Garbage and the Flowers, which was kind of a, ref a column about uh, resources, a resource column. Um, and then wrote other stories, too, around childcare issues and um, uh, being mothers, women and mothers, and um, other kind of other issues around. Um, I think it did a couple of interviews with peace activists. Um, and that I also had jobs, of course. I was a librarian. Um, I had worked in college and library, so I was a librarian for a while at the um, at, at several associations, um, and made my living that way. Um, and also waitresses. Um, I remember waitressing with you at the trio. That's <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, waitressed many places, places in that time period, um, and I think I was a nanny for a few months, which was horrible, horrible job with a woman who had nervous breakdown because she had four kids <laughs> under eight. So um, I was taking care of them while she was recovering from her nervous breakdown. So um, that certainly put me off ever having children. <laughs> so, <laughs> but at so. some point, uh, you found yourself. Pregnant. Right. Yeah. It was in February of uh, two th of 1970. I was pregnant, and um, you know, went to the free clinic and got a pregnancy test, and knew right away that I did not, you know, want to have a child. That I was not um, ready. I was 21. You know, I didn't have a career, uh, and I was living in subsistence. I, you know, loved the man I was with, but not. It was not, you know, what I considered a serious enough relationship that we were going to. You know, father and mother, a child together, parent a child together, uh, and it was just not a time in my life where I was ready to have a child. And so I tossed around. You know, I had friends in the movement and the women's movement, and friends around, and tossed around going to New York. Um, people I knew people who had had abortions, um, and most of them had had them a little bit younger and gone to New York, which at that point was the only place in the States where it was um, basically uh, a matter of choice. Uh, D.C., um, you could obtain a therapeutic abortion if you could get a psychiatrist to um, agree to say that it would be dangerous for your mental health. Um, most of the private hospitals, it was a very pro forma kind of thing. I mean, they basically would accept uh, it was really uh, they gave you a piece of paper that you'd go to a psychiatrist. They gave you a piece of paper, and you went on your way. So it was very pro forma. Um, so it was almost a game. Um, what were but, your early? It's, I'm sorry. Go ahead. But the the pr public hospital, um, DC General, which was the only public hospital in the city, 
um, was refusing to uh, do therapeutic abortions um, for many women unless there was a real physical problem or something more, much more acute. So at some point, some, I think uh, one of my friends from the women's movement came and said, hey, we've been looking for a test case to sue DC General. Would you be interested? Um, and I pretty much immediately said, sure, why not? Um, not really thinking of the consequences so much. Um, and then I think the first, so really within two weeks, I had, I had to go to DC General and request an abortion and then be, um, uh, you know, then be turned down. Um, and that was, we knew that was going to happen. Uh, and, um, and at that point, I was probably six to eight weeks pregnant. Um, and of course, there was all this, you know, okay, well, think about it kind of stuff going on. And, you know, then, but one of the, so there were injunctions because you know, there's a time issue um, with, with therapeutic abortion. You really, you know, need to do it within the first 12 weeks. And the time, the clock was ticking. Um, so your attorneys took D.C. General to court? Right, exactly. And they basically um, put in on an injunction and um, they won, but D.C. General still refused to, prefer, to do the abortion. Um, by that time I'd gotten, I think, two letters because I had, I'd, I had a backup plan. Um, this was a class action, uh, so I was the first plaintiff in it, so this, but it was a class action, it wasn't just me. Um, and so by that time I had a backup plan because we knew that they were going to refuse. And um, so I had, uh, I, you know, had arranged an abortion at GW with a private physician um, and being paid for by Medicaid. Um, I still had to get, GW required two letters from a psychiatrist. Um, from saying two psychiatrists? That, from two psychiatrists, yes, saying that I had a mental health um, So what problem. was that like? It was very humiliating. I mean, I, you know, I knew it was kind of a pro forma. I think one of the people, if I, you know, it's hard to remember. I think one of the psychiatrists was someone I knew and could, you know, a woman. And, I, you know, so I felt very comfortable and she was very, you know, comfortable. The other guy didn't know it all. And I, you know, I, you know, had to basically say I was going to kill myself unless I got an abortion, which, which was not true, true. Was, yeah. which is not true. Um, and so that was not pleasant to do. You know, it was not something, you know, I thought it was ridiculous. Um, you know, I did not feel that way. Um, and I thought that I should have that choice. Uh, but I went through it. Um, and then, so we went through several court hearings. Uh, at one point, the judge said, well, honey, why don't you, you know, why didn't you just call your parents and get them to help you out? And so I had to explain that. Um, and at uh, you know the, at some at, during the time I was pregnant or it was might have been after um, they it was brought up in Congress at some point and some some congressman said this young lady is a dupe of the ACLU and you know she should not be here um, so that kind of thing and you know happened and um, uh, at some point the my partner's mother. Um, called me and asked if she could raise the child. And that was very hard, you know. I mean, I, you know, I felt for her. Um, she but wanted it didn't, to grandchild. Right, exactly. But it didn't change my mind uh, with that. Um, and so you did this. I, I'm remembering what you said about your early awareness as a child of, of a young woman in, in the sixth grade who had to drop out of school. Right, yeah, and at, in my, I think my sixth grade class, I had a classmate who was, I think she was a little older, maybe 13, and, um, and was pregnant, um, you know, probably as a result of abuse, sexual abuse, and had to drop out. And we had a friend of the families who um, got pregnant and ended up in a, um, you know, Florence Crittenden home for unwed mothers, uh, and later, committed suicide. Um, so the so I, I was aware about abortion. Was. So I was aware. Um, I think one thing I read, the key, a key thing for me, and, and I think is di that's different from today, is I really felt no shame. 
And I'm not sure today, you know, that that's possible because the atmosphere almost seems worse today. Maybe, I, I don't know why, but it almost seems worse. Um, it does seem worse. I think it is worse. You know, I think when in the early 70s we had a women's movement, we had each other to, mm -hmm. to declare over and over again, mm -hmm. the choice was absolutely that of the woman. Not right, the, exactly. Not the wider world, right, right. not the congressman, yeah. not the judge, not the doctors. Yeah. Just it is the woman's choice, her body, her yeah. rules. And, and I felt I very think, supported by that. And very, you know, and you know, I was angry, but I was a, you know, I never felt any shame or feel like this was not the right decision. It would make me sad, but you know, afterwards there was some sadness, but I never felt like, oh, this was a bad decision or I was an evil person or maybe I didn't grow up Catholic. That probably helped. I grew up Episcopalian, which is kind of like you know, Catholic light without the guilt. So that helped. And then I was also had pretty much become an atheist by the time you know. I was in high school. So that probably helped, not being religious. But it really was a very different atmosphere, and I never felt. And I think also it was so clear at that point that women, you know, that abortion was important to women's lives, that people died from illegal abortions. You know, when I, you know I didn't know anybody who died, but I knew people who had had back alley abortions. And, you know, was awful. It was dangerous. Um, dangerous. Yeah. And I knew people who got pregnant and, you know, had babies when they didn't want to have babies. And um, so, so your ability to say yes um, to it was because as you saw it as a principle. Yeah, right. You could exactly. For it. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and earlier so. when you said you d you hadn't quite thought about the consequences when you said yes immediately. What were you talking about? I think it was more just the publicity and things like the being, you know, uh, the Im this image of a 21-year-old 20, hippie white trash girl getting pregnant and having an abortion, you know, indigent. You know, at that point I wasn't working because I needed Medicare to, you know, pay for it um, and to also go to D.C. General. Um, so that kind, I think that kind of it was know, a lot of fear involved, wasn't there? Um, you know, a lot of that was kind of feeling uncomfortable. I remember once the I was at home at the uh, our commune, and all these sirens and the police were su surrounding, you know, in the alley where we lived and around the house. And I thought, oh shit, that's all we need is for you know a um, publicity and well, you know whether oh some you know this woman who's in you know in the news is a um, you know, plaintiff and an abortion case, you know, her house is being busted and they're all going to jail for drugs and it turned out to be some other house or not, you know, not our house, but I, you know. So I think there was a certain amount at that point of um, just feeling pressure and, um, and I didn't feel alone, but feeling like, you know, it, w it was just, it was not as easy as I think I had, you know, gone into it thinking. Um, Nonetheless, then, it seemed to people at the time that you were very, very, very brave. And I remember thinking it was comparable to what young men were doing when they were refusing the draft. Oh, probably not, but oh, <laughs> not I at guess. all. But they went to jail, I didn't, you know, or, or had to go to Canada. So. Yeah. Yes. Let me ask you how you got pregnant. Okay. <laughs> you can sure. <laughs> sure. Sorry, I'm like the way everybody does. <laughs> Was it IVF? <laughs> the old fashioned way. Right. <coughs> okay. So I think I understand how you got pregnant, but can you explain the birth control situation at yeah. the time? Yeah. I was settings? using birth control. I was using birth control. I don't think I ever not used, did not use birth control until I wanted to get pregnant for real. I mean, ever in my life. I used a diaphragm and it didn't work. And, you know. Diaphragms are notorious. Uh, having been a family planning and a um, public health person for many years, I know what the odds are now. But um, yeah, it was a failure, contraceptive failure. Um, and every woman I knew, you know, almost lived in fear of that happening uh, at that point. You know, the, we have better, better methods now, so I think people live much less fear. But 
then where, you know, I couldn't, I, the, the pill was around and I had started to have migraines and so I st had to stop taking the pill. I certainly would have preferred to do that um, than the diaphragm. But uh, that, well, yeah, so the diet, those were the two methods. At that point they weren't using IUDs very much for um, non-women um, who hadn't been pregnant in the past. Um, so I did, what was it? So those were the two choices and condoms. But, um, so, yeah, so it was a contraception failure, um, which is true in many cases. Yeah, it was, uh, uh, was certainly true then. So you, I understand you went to the free clinic. Yes, right, the so Washington there were free clinic. There were alternative institutions. Exactly. The Washington free clinic was in Georgetown at the uh, Chur at a church, it might have been Grace Church, um, on Wisconsin Avenue, and all everybody there was a volunteer, and it was really easy to get a pregnancy test and get counseling, and walk you just walk in, and you know maybe it cost a minimal fee, but um, you know, but it was definitely an institution that started in the '60s and continued for many many years to provide care for people, um, and we were very lucky to have it around. So as I understand the timeline, the Supreme Court was considering Roe v. Wade but hadn't made a decision when your suit was filed. Yes. Maybe I should just I think. I will. mention the actual mm -hmm. name of the case, which was Mary Dole et al. Plaintiffs versus General Hospital of the District of Columbia mm -hmm. Defendants. Right, right, exactly. Um, yeah. And so that was in March of 1970 that the judge ruled, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then there were a series that right. went for what? Three years, or four years, days? right? Uh, well, a series three or four of hearings, three or four days, and right? Then exactly. Years yeah. until and then the years Supreme until the final. Well, no, years until the final case came, basically was held for was it was through the it went through the appeal systems, um, so it was not until 1974 that the case was finished. And so. this um, wonderful poster from the Washington right. Post from Wednesday, April 9th, uh, 1974. April 10th, 1974. April 10th. Yep, yep. Um, City uh -huh. Hospital opens policy on abortion. Right, right. So that was uh, that was something people brought to a celebration. Right, a surprise celebration. Um, you were surprised. That, yes, yeah. right. I had no idea. Nice. I mean, I it was. I think it, it was after. Um, uh, April 4th that it happened, but uh, a friend of mine must have blown it up and brought it to a celebration and, you know, we probably drank champagne and toasted the fact that it had finally, you know, four years later it was settled. Um, I mean, I think they had been doing it even before then. I think they'd been doing abortions before then, but I think this was the final, the end of the case. So, you know, and my attorneys called me too and I think let me know what was going on after that, I think after the Post article came out. Um, Who were your yeah. attorneys? Um, William Nussbaum um, and Carolyn Nickerson. Um, yeah, he worked for uh, a law firm, but it was doing it pro bono, I think, for the ACLU. I think ACLU was, uh, you know, I, I think Carolyn Nickerson was doing it for the ACLU. So, um, yeah. So you'd had three, four years by then mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. end your thoughts when it happened? It was just relief, like, okay, mm -hmm. finally something happened, you know, that yeah. this was, you know, I mean, that this was, o one, over, I mean, it wasn't, I didn't feel it particularly relief, but, you know, finally, this is very clear, you know, and it worked, you know, the, the little, you know, the, um, boa constrictor, the, you know, or the python that moved through the system. Um, so then, in, then lower income women in the district right could could go to the general the exactly. public hospital yes and yes. ask for a therapeutic abortion right right and yeah and get it and get it yeah 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 and they didn't have to jump through hoops huge amounts of hoops so yeah so how has this affected the rest of your life uh, well I have certainly had. Um, a big passion for women's health, um, even probably since then. Um, I worked in women's theater for many years after that, and uh, uh, part of our process was to um, do workshops. We did a lot of workshops around women's health issues and women's issues in general, 
and um, you know, when it was to you know, the whole process was to empower women um, to tell their stories, and then to create different endings for their stories in the improvisatory work we did. And we also performed all over the country um, at various times. And this is in the early 70s. Um, we were called Earth on Young Women's Theater Group. And we, um, so we had several plays that we took on the road uh, to colleges and to women's festivals and to other events, um, GI ca cafes. Um, and, uh, and certainly part of that for me was, you know, some of the issues around women's health and, you know, issues of rape and, um, uh, you know, contraception, pregnancy, you know, uh, motherhood, all those kinds of issues came up. In, um, in, you know, in the stories we told, so that was really important. Um, so for a few years, I was, you know, I was involved in the arts. I was, I ran a poetry magazine on tape. I was the managing editor for a poetry ma a magazine on tape. Was that Black Box? Black Box mm -hmm. magazine. And then I worked as an activist in the with the ACLU Prison Project, um, working around prisoners and civil rights. And then at some point, decided that one, I wanted a you know, kind of stable profession. Um, at that point, I hadn't finished my degree and I wanted a stable profession and wanted to work in women's health. And so I went to nursing school um, and uh, at Catholic University and got my degree in nursing, um, kind of concomitant with um, getting married, uh, getting pregnant with my first child, um, buying my first apartment, uh, getting Actually my first nursing job and, and being on the board of, right, exactly, the apartment. The, board, the apartment. Um, so all that happened about six months. Um, and uh, so then I worked mostly in women's health for the next, put women's health and public health for the next um, 30 years, 30-something um, years. Um, I um, worked in doing um, a lot of maternity care, uh, home visits, I wrote a um, childbirth manual for the um, U.S. Army and uh, military through the Red Cross and then toured in Europe to do the trainings for, um, you know, for putting out the program. Um, and I worked in home visits during the crack epidemic in D.C. where I'd go visit um, moms with substance abuse issues, um, pregnant moms and parenting moms with substance abuse issues, issues to, you know, kind of care for them and make sure that they, the baby was getting um, what they needed or, or not, um, and did that for several years in various programs and um, in, you know, postpartum care. And then ended up with uh, working for Arlington County for 15 years um, running clinics, running many clinics and many home visiting programs, starting um, the first teen clinic and one of the first teen clinics in Northern Virginia for teen moms. Um, so really started that and got that going. And then an innovative program of care for, um, uh, you know, for uh, prenatal, for postnatal women, for women postpartum, where women and the babies got kind of their postnatal visits together at the same time and got all the, that they needed in one visit instead of having to come for two or three separate visits. Um, and worked in, um, ironically worked in homeland security issues with, a, you know, as we did for a, a county health department after 9-11. Um, and, you know, that was involved in that. Um, and one nice thing with uh, working for Arlington is they let me be the resident playwright and um, director. So I would um, create plays and um, performances for various kind of um, kind of uh, um, development. Uh, you know, if there was there were issues of, for education around tech issues or education around you know something that was going on, new program coming in or new that. So I would I developed some musicals and some radio plays and various things. So that was lovely having a you know kind of a very informal role as a playwright and director in a public health department of a county, a county, you know, so that was fun. So I did that for, you know, 15 years and then uh, retired and had fun for a couple of years and then went back te to teaching at um, Georgetown. In the nursing uh, school? In the nursing school in public health, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's kind of, you know, was my career. Um,
and you know a lot around women's health issues and advocate for women's health, advocated for women's health and for um, you know preventing pregnancies and you know um, enjoying them and enjoying when them when they, yeah when, when, they're they, when they're wanted and planned they're yes wanted. yes exactly. Do you have thoughts to share lessons that you would like to pass on to younger activists? I think that you know the most important things, and it's wh what I did throughout my career, and also in things like building a school for my children, a Quaker school, and um, various uh, community activism that I was involved in, is to find the partnerships, find the people, and the organizations that will work with you and work as units. I mean, I think that you know whatever I did, I think it, that was, and I tell that to my students. I talk to my students a lot about that. Find the key people, and find the key organizations, and um, and you know wherever you are, and work together, and work as I, I think that's probably the most important thing. And it's hard, I think it's harder and harder. You know, we're more atomized, and every grant you write, I mean, I could still write grants for various things. Every grant you write talks about you have to have partnerships. You know, you have to work together, and but it's I think it's increasingly harder as the money has gotten tighter. And uh, um, you know, you know, the pie gets smaller, and you're trying to divide it more and more, chop it up into more and more ways. Uh, but I think that, to me, you know, whether it was organizing a housing co-op or um, developing a school, um, or you know, a babysitting co-op or whatever, is kind of finding whatever partnerships and community you can. And to me, that's been kind of something that the thing that's run through my life. Is, um, is community and partnerships, and I try to tell my children this is really important, you know, in your life, you know, find it wherever you can, um, in whatever way you can. I think, um, I think it's really important. And you've done a remarkable and, job um, of it. I think, you know, it's just been, you know, very, uh, you know, a big thing in my life, and I, you know, that's kept me going. So. All right. Thank you, Julie. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. Thank you. Yep. Anything else? Oh, one thing I hadn't brought it was some of the things right. I did after. Um, okay, go. You know, it. sure. After this was, I'd forgotten. I was pretty much. I think about nine months later, I went to the Vince Reynolds Brigade, which was a great, um, which was a program in Cuba where you cut sugar cane. We were. We, it was a group of about a hundred of us who were selected, and we cut sugar cane for six weeks in Cuba and then toured the island for two weeks. And it was kind of a friendship organization, very, um, you know, it was illegal to travel to Cuba. So we flew from, Me I think we flew to Mexico and then came back on a freighter to Canada to get there, you know, back and forth. And it was a wonderful experience. You know, it was really incredible experience. And I think also just seeing both what happened, you know, what the medical system was like and the educational system and seeing that things, you know, were a very different kind of uh, way of living and seeing the, also the poverty and the, the people could live with, you know, not a lot was, um, that was really a great experience and something that, you know, again, I, it's, you know, kind of continued to, you know, resonate in various ways. So, she speaks um, Spanish now. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. Which I learned kind of some in, in Cuban and then some also working with clients because I've worked with, you know, people, mostly Central American folks, for my whole career. So, and that was just, yeah, but it was a wonderful experience. And, um. and, thinking, and thinking about this, it's like you guys did a lot of, a lot of activism, did a lot of, made a lot of goals, that kind of stuff, but we look at things today, like Ferguson and the sexual assaults on the campuses, and we haven't gotten very far. And it's like, what, what, what can be done to keep the fight going? I think we just live, our world is so much more complex these days that it makes it much harder. Um, you know, I've talked a lot, of, my son and I talk all the time, he's a, quote, professional clicktivist, which is a nasty word, basically, we don't, we don't really want to say that, but basically he works with social media in, um, in an international organization. Um, and where they, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, click this to sign this petition, that kind of thing, and they get hits and they do this. And he says, Mom, it's kind of like being in an um, advertising agency, only you're advertising good things. So, you know, he has, he's, you know, there's, 
it's great, but it, you know, where do you go from there? And I think he's been successful at thinking uh, further about where you go and what, you know, what there else is to do. Um, I must say, having participated with Democracy Spring this, um, this year, which is an organization focused on campaign finance reform and voters' rights, I've been very um, just mo motivated and ad 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 admire these young activists who, who are working with that tremendously. I mean, they, you know, they're just, uh, they're great. You know, we had a thousand people were arrested at the Capitol this spring. Um, nobody knew about it because it's really difficult to get through the screed of media. Um, they had, you know, basically they had good media themselves. They hired big publicists. They, you know, they did everything they could have done. But would you see it in the New York Times, your little tiny piece, Washington Post, little tiny piece, um, national news? No. We haven't had this many people arrested in the White House, arrested in the Capitol since the 60s or 70s. This was like a big thing. And, you know, what does it take to get, you know, the kind of coverage? I mean, part of it was, you know, at least the anti-war movement, people's lives were on the, really on the line, many people's lives. And uh, with the draft, and I think that was a big, you know, a big part of it. And what, a, you know, it's not the same, you know. And campaign finance reform is a, a little, definitely a more abstract kind of, um, you know, thing. But they managed to make it real. I think they managed to really make it real in, in the me in what they send out and what they did. But it's, I think that was the thing with the war, and same with the civil rights movement. People, you know, people's lives, you know, people had had enough, and um, and you know, being totally oppressed. And I think, I don't know, you know, I don't know what will, you know, I don't think that's, and that's kind of, to me, what Black Lives Matter comes out of this, you know, kind of just, okay, what do we do? Where, does, where do we go from there? And I think just, I think there are so many talent, incredibly more talented and, um, uh, you know, talented and wonderful young people, you know, who keep coming up and doing things. Um, I, I guess part of me hopes that they, some of them will run for office. You know, that, you know, we'll keep getting more people. That's what we need. Bernie Sanders needs to basically say, okay, get in your school boards. You know, get in your, um, you know, figure out how to get at the lower level and move up. It's hard because of the funding. I mean, that, again, I think that's where campaign finance reform comes in. You know, I mean, the Tea Party did it because they had huge amounts of gobs of corporate money from the Koch brothers. Um, but at some point, you know, if we can do something about that, or maybe, I don't know, maybe us lefty baby boomers have to throw money at them. Um, but again, I think, you know, whatever we can do to encourage all this positive, incredible energy from young people is really important. You were arrested during democracy screen. Yeah, right, right, yes, yes. And how was it? Um, it was, as I told people, it was a rest light. I mean, it's like, you know, they, these Capitol Police are the most professional, and, you know, they're like, do you have enough water? <laughs> and um, are you okay? And just be, you know, sit down, it's very hot, so be careful. And we basically were arrested and processed on the, star, on, on the spot, and um, the only thing is I haven't gotten my nursing license renewed because I had to say that I'd been arrested, and it, I guess, is a long process, so I'm, luckily I'm not, at this point, working. Um, taking off some time, so I haven't worried about that. But I, and I think it'll be fine eventually. Hopefully, I won't have to go deal with the DC bureaucracy. But um, you, know, you were worried about but, getting to uh, Australia to see those grandbabies. Yeah, because yeah. Of and I, we got a visa, so it was no problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but it was you know it was a lovely experience being with all these folks. There were about I guess 80 of us or 80 or 90 of us got arrested that day, and you know it was. Um, Felt great. Felt really great. Uh, uh, one thing you and I talked about uh, is that the the tools have changed. Yes, you know, exactly. There's, there's a, right. a whole lot more right. tools out there. Ways yeah. of reaching people. Yeah. Right. How, right. You know, if those were available to you in the '60s, would that be great or would it be terrible? <laughs> I think it's a mixed bag because I think you know people are bombarded over and over again with. 
um, you know, with so many things. Um, I mean, I think of YouTube somehow. I think of using YouTube as a thing. We, you know, we, um, I'm a gun activist, and uh, I, we sit out in front of the White House every Monday from 11 to 1 and talk to people about gun control. Well, that's fine and dandy, but we reach maybe 50 people at a time, and uh, half of them are from overseas. Um, but and so I keep thinking of various tools we could use to broaden our appeal, and you know, and we've certainly we're not that, certainly luckily there are many many other groups and things are changing, but uh, it's, it seems very old fashioned to me. But I don't know, I you know I find you know film and documentaries and um, social and you know Twitter certainly seems a way, although I just can't do it, you know, it makes my brain I think I'd be Swiss cheese. But luckily other people are doing it. To get get messages out, and you know, I think it's been, you know, both in you know, um, internationally and in the states. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, a lot of the so use of social media has just been amazing, and I wish we'd had it. You know, to do more things. We had, in some ways, in the women. I remember one point in the women's movement, we um, were against any media coverage, and really, I mean, I remember people smashing cameras of. Um, uh, of reporters uh, taking them and smashing them and doing things, we, we thought the reporting was so bad that we, you know, that w we didn't believe in it. Now I think we were totally nuts. I mean, it was bad, but bad publicity, as my son always reminds me, is better than no publicity. Um, and so, you know, very different world we live in, and we, certainly we see it with the rise of Trump. I think bad, you know, bad publicity. Hey. Seems, you know, pretty much to have gone his way. Um, Did you ever imagine, in as a young person, that guns would be a, an issue for you? Um, yeah, because I used to fight guys when I was a little kid who were, you know, who were cap gun, who were like into pistol whipping and into, you know, I, you know, I grew up in the South, honey. So, you know, I, you know, grew up with these guys who were, you know, I'm going to shoot you down and stuff like that. So. Yeah, I mean, you know, I never, I never believed that it would be this bad. You know, that things would be this bad, um, and that we'd have these. You know, again, wasn't as much an issue in the '70s. I don't think. Um, handgun, everybody having hand, you know, three hundred thousand handguns. Um, when, when did the gun issue become important to you? Uh, well, and when I was in public health, uh, I studied, did a lot of studying around it, and then what happened was that. It shut down. You know the whole uh, public, uh, the whole gun, um, uh, the research money for public health and guns was shut down by the Congress. And I thought this is totally outrageous. And that was, I think, when after that I was on the streets and I was in the streets of D.C. during the crack e epidemic. And I would literally jump into my car when the police started chasing people. You know the the druggies would have guns, the police would have guns. They'd be running around, you know, in in alleys and. You know, I've been mugged a few times. Um, you know, I lived in D.C., and so it was always an issue. And then, just recently, I think as the mass shootings seem to have progressed and gotten worse, and around issues around domestic violence, it just you know, I, when I had the time and I was you know, uh, working less, I felt like that was an issue I could you know, hopefully make some inroads in. And I helped de develop some curriculum around it for students at, um, at, at Georgetown, you know, for our students, and to, you know, make it a part of our public health curriculum um, also. So I, I think it was just, it's, you know, in the last few years, the, you know, after um, the shooting in Connecticut and Aurora, and um, just as heartbreaking that it didn't stop, you know. You're going to Australia. Yes. You're yes. familiar with how, what they did. Oh yes, <laughs> and we have at least one pe one person every week who every comes Monday up. Every Monday. Every Monday who tells us the Some whole story. Some Australian will come and right. say, "We yes. feel so sorry for you. Let right. us tell you what we did." Exactly. And we let them tell us yes. because we like to hear it. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm sure I'll hear many of those stories, and then I'll have to get back to them and saying, "What, what are they doing with refugees?" So anyway. You don't have to put that on tape. <laughs> yeah, I heard a story about the refugees this morning. Yeah, yeah. right. Pretty horrible. Yeah. Pretty horrible. So, nothing new for them, but, you know, as for us, so. Okay. Yeah. Anything else you want to add? I think we're good. No? Sounds good. Yeah. Thank you, Julie. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Great. so much.
close to Bay Point. Oh, it's up in here. Uh, what kind of kind boat do you have there? It's a um, it's a French design. It's a motor sailor. It's just a little raggedy boat. Yeah. It's not a. Is that for a recreational? You live on it or? No, no. It's only twenty four feet long. Okay. It's just for fun. So you, so you work in Arlington. I live in Arlington. Oh, do you? Yeah. I love Arlington. It's a great place. Great local government. Yeah. Great mm -hmm. government. Yeah. Very few governments. I, and I went there and thought, oh, I'm going to work here for five months. Yeah? Yeah. I went there as a, it was a, I just had a grant. You know, it was a grant program. Uh -huh. And 15 years later, I left. I can't believe it. But wow. I worked for a county governor's so Probably the only county governor. Yeah. And then it changed. My business changed from yeah. manager to. Yeah. Must be tough in Arlington, though, because you struggle against Richmond so many times. Yeah, it was very tough. 